Hello and welcome or welcome back to the Open Textbook Network Summit. Thank you for joining us for today's session, Teaching Pressbooks and Programmatic Implications, Session 2 with Lauren Ray. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm Publishing Director at the Open Textbook Network, soon to be the Open Education Network. If you're not familiar with our organization, we are a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OTN. I'm serving as a facilitator for today's session, and I'm joined by Barb Thies, the community manager at the OTN, who will be moderating questions for Lauren. Before we begin, we'd like to share a few important details with you. We're live tweeting our session, so join us on Twitter at open underscore textbooks. The hashtag for the summit is OTN Summit 20. The session is being recorded and the video and transcripts will be posted on our YouTube channel shortly after summit has concluded. If you'd like to ask Lauren a question, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. There is an option to make your questions anonymous and we will be happy to address as many of those questions as possible. Please note there is also the ability to turn on live transcripts in the bottom right corner of your Zoom toolbar if you would like to do that. We're committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees, and you can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu slash summit community norms. Please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. Now, please join me in welcoming today's presenter, Lauren Ray. Lauren is the Open Education and Psychology Librarian at the University of Washington Libraries. Lauren implemented and launched the UW Libraries Pressbooks platform for OER publishing and provides consultations and workshops on OER creation. If you were able to join us yesterday, Lauren demoed her faculty workshop um, experience in Pressbooks and started to talk a little bit about programmatic implications and the questions that have arisen since she started teaching faculty press books. And that's what we're going to dive deeper into today. So I'll turn things over now to Lauren. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, happy Wednesday, everyone. Um, and thanks so much for joining my session, um, part two of teaching press books and programmatic implications. Um, as Karen said, um, my name is Lauren. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm at the University of Washington Libraries um, here in Seattle. Um, so if you joined yesterday, I gave an overview of um, how we've implemented the Pressbooks EDU network at the University of Washington Libraries as a tool to support OER creation. Um, and as Karen said, I demoed the Introduction to Pressbooks workshop that I give over Zoom to faculty at my institution. Um, so today I'm going to talk about first what's changed, the impact that's been made since we've implemented Pressbooks. Um, then I'm going to talk about the kinds of questions and concerns I see from instructors when I do these workshops, um, questions these raise for developing a program of support, and some things we've done or are starting to do to address those. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about sustainability of programs to support OER authoring and publishing. And finally, I'll pose a few big picture questions that I'm hoping we can talk through and might spark some ideas um, or more Q&A. Um, I feel like I should have the disclaimer of I've um, learned a lot, but I don't know everything about Pressbooks or what this means for um, perfectly delivering programming at my institution. So I'm just hoping um, to get people's thoughts and, and questions through the Q&A um, throughout this session and at the end. Okay, so first I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Pressbooks at the UW. So a quick refresher, or if you weren't here yesterday, um, yet um, at the University of Washington, we launched the Pressbooks EDU network um, in the fall um, of 2018. Um, we initially had it um, on a, funded on a two-year pilot um, through endowment funding. Um, and recently learned that we would be continuing to fund it. So that's really good news for us. Um, and Pressbooks is a tool that allows UW instructors to author and publish openly licensed course materials. 
Um, currently, we have eight published books in our UW Libraries Pressbooks catalog, although from the back end as the network manager, I can see that we have over 300 books in our network, um, many of which are probably practice books or things people kind of got started when they were after they attended my workshop. Um, and we have one um, 0.5 FT open education librarian, that's me or um, half of me. And you can see our Pressbooks network um, at uw.pressbooks.pl. I've offered 17 workshops um, over the last um, two years, year and a half, um, both um, introduction to Pressbooks workshops and then advanced Pressbooks workshops that um, go more into things like hypothesis and H5P and cloning. Um, over that time, we've had over 100, around 150 people attend our workshops, primarily that's faculty at UW, followed by staff, graduate students, and librarians. And the goals of these workshops for me have been to raise awareness of Pressbooks as an open educational resources authoring platform, um, to really showcase a diversity of examples of what OER looks like, which is something that um, I think faculty have been asking for and really appreciate having here. Um, it's also given me an opportunity as someone who was new to OER when I came into my position and who's sort of piloting this um, uh, network as well as services to really hear faculty questions and concerns around OER authoring. Um, and it's also given me a chance to um, sort of uh, get people on the network, creating things on the network, um, that's our Pressbooks network, um, so that we can build um, use cases and examples of how it's being used in order to help make a case for future um, funding and support for continuing to fund the platform. So now I just want to highlight some of the books that have been completed or added to our public Pressbooks catalog. I talked a little bit about some of these yesterday, so apologies if this is a repeat, but I just, I find all of these very exciting and just want to um, show you what's been done here and the impact. Um, so this first example is um, the Batch Papo, and I'm sure I'm butchering that pronunciation. Um, this is an introduction to Portuguese um, textbook that was written by Eduardo Viana da Silva, lecturer in our Portuguese and Spanish uh, language department. Eduardo wanted to create a Brazilian Portuguese textbook for students who have English as their first language, um, but also have it be applicable to um, others outside of higher education, including adults learning Portuguese and immigrants in Brazil. Um, Eduardo um, was responding to the lack of Brazilian Portuguese um, um, educational materials as opposed to European Portuguese, which is co covered more frequently in educational textbooks. And he said that he felt uncomfortable asking students to pay $200 for a textbook. So he wanted to be able to create something that was affordable and free for students. Um, because it was developed as an OER, Eduardo was able to incorporate meaningful audio exercises into his book in Pressbooks, reflecting daily life in Brazil. Um, he did recordings while in Brazil of student voices, providing a culturally relevant experience with authentic voices. Um, so this is um, something that he created in Pressbooks um, and um, is now available um, in our network. Um, these are two examples um, that sort of came out of um, uh, conversations that um, my colleagues, other subject librarians here um, at the UW Libraries had with um, students. So on the left is La France Sauvé, a dramaturgical casebook. Um, and this was created by our former fine and performing arts librarian, Angela Weaver, who saw an opportunity to utilize press books to create a production book. Um, which is a common format used in performing arts um, and also a format used at the UW's drama department. It's a printed notebook with a play script, stage manager notes, and design for things like costumes, set, and lighting. Um, and Angela thought that moving the production book into an online format in which multiple people could collaborate and comment outside of the production itself using um, the hypothesis tool that she turned on within her Pressbooks book um, would help convince faculty in her department to use it for this. So she kind of created this as an example and presented it at a faculty meeting. On the right um, is a book called um, How to FOIA, A Guide to Filing Freedom of Information Act Requests. Um, which was created by a graduate student, Emily Willard, who was a UW Center for Human Rights graduate research fellow. 
Um, she created this guide to accompany a training workshop on how to file FOIAs um, that she had been um, offering through the Center for Human Rights um, and as part of the 10th anniversary celebration there. The guide includes information on researching, writing, submission, and tracking of FOIA requests. Um, and it's really now, because it's on Pressbooks, it's available for anyone who's interested in, interested in filing a FOIA related to public interest. Um, and she said, using the FOIA is an important tool by making this manual available free to the public. It's my hope that more people will have more access to information. My goal would be that people could take this guide to the basics and adapt it to their own work and share it with colleagues in their network. Um, so Emily um, learned about this actually through our subject librarian, um, Emily Keller, who's the librarian for um, public policy um, and political science. Um, Emily had attended um, a press books workshop that I gave for subject librarians um, and Angela Weaver, our art librarian, had attended the um, workshop on press books that I gave for our arts and humanities librarians. So each of these librarians kind of learned about the press books network through those workshops that I offered um, and then were able to kind of um, reach out to students or meet a need that they already saw within their own department um, for using this platform for creating OER. Another example that I keep talking about um, I mentioned yesterday was this badass women of the Pacific Northwest. This is a student authored zine project created at our University of Bothell campus course, um, Rad Women in the Global South, led by Professor Julie Shane, librarians Penelope Wood and Denise Hatwick, and peer facilitator Nicole Carter. Um, and uh, the zine's a collection of biographies and portraits of badass women in the Pacific Northwest. Undergraduate students collaborated to create this resource. Um, they did all of the research, um, created the artwork, was just really incredible um, in this project. Um, and I just have a few screenshots here from it. So the students all learned press books um, and divided into teams um, to work on taking different roles, collaborating and putting this together in the course of one quarter, which is really incredible. Um, in the process of creating the book, students learned about open access, creative commons, and their rights and responsibilities as open scholarship authors. I highlighted this at the very end yesterday, but didn't um, get a chance to talk about it, but I really encourage you to take a look at this video. There's a link here to the YouTube video um, describing the creation of this. Um, if you don't have time to watch the whole thing, I recommend starting around minute four to minute eight. Um, and you hear from students who are involved in creating this book in press books and what it looked like after they printed it as a zine. Um, and um, this uh, example is another student authored work, um, Critical Filipinx American Histories and Their Artifacts. It's a book authored by Professor Rick Bonus um, and students in his Critical Filipinx American Histories course in the fall of 2019. Um, this is a collaboration that Rick has had for many years with the UW's Burke Museum of Natural History. Um, he's had an assignment in which students um, create poster projects um, based on artifacts that they select within the museum that don't deal with Filipinx history. Um, and so we worked with Rick to transform this into an open pedagogy project within Pressbooks. Um, I taught students on Pressbooks and our copyright librarian met with them to talk with them about um, their rights and responsibilities as student authors. Um, and um, this quote is really nice from the preface. So Rick says, we critically examined the ways in which Filipinx American identities were and continue to be co-constructed how Filipinx American cultures and social practices are dynamically and endlessly evolving, and why ideas and questions regarding the past, present, and future of Filipinx Americans matter in relation to other groups and to practices of power and resistance. Um, I should say that this was inspired by um, the project at the University of Wisconsin that I mentioned in my presentation yesterday, done by Ann Smart Martin's class, and that I learned about through the Steel Wax South at Pressbooks. Um, Rick was really inspired by that project um, to create kind of this museum student authored collaboration. And finally, um, telling our stories. This is a collaboration um, between a course at our UW Tacoma um, campus taught by Dr. Sonia de la Cruz and the UW Center for Equity and Inclusion and the library at our Tacoma campus. Um, and this is um, short digital stories documenting student experiences at the UW Tacoma and it includes 
It's all put together in Pressbooks and it's a multimedia project, including um, video interviews. Um, students worked in teams to document and produce sh short digital stories highlighting the experiences of other UW Tacoma students with regard to one or various aspects of their identity, um, whether related to race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, disability, place of origin, etc. That's from the book intro. Okay, so now that I've highlighted a few examples of um, books that have been created in our Pressbooks network um, here at the UW Libraries, I want to talk about some programmatic implications for OER publishing support. Um, first, I just want to highlight kind of our um, what we have been supporting. So we take a sort of author DIY publishing program model um, here, which is that we provide access to instructors to the Pressbooks platform. Um, we also, I provide consultations on Pressbooks um, and when faculty are interested in open pedagogy projects, as well as copyright. Um, we also um, provide referrals to instructional designers and LMS support and other units on campus. Um, when a book is completed and if it's openly licensed, we'll add it to our Pressbooks catalog um, and to our, um, which adds it to our discovery um, catalog as well as the open textbook library if it meets those criteria. Um, and we also provide student authorship support. So the examples that I um, talked about earlier, going into classes and working with students on Pressbooks. Um, However, we don't have a full publishing program, so we don't provide um, things like copy editing, proofreading, graphic design, project management, or marketing. We are not set up um, to have that sort of level of support um, in terms of publishing support at the UW Libraries. Um, and I also don't um, provide consultations for faculty who are interested in using Pressbooks for something that isn't gonna be openly licensed or free. Um, However, this is not formalized. <laughs> so we don't have this in writing yet. This is something that we have been, um, I've been communicating to faculty after workshops or when they ask questions or reach out to me. Um, and I think this is really um, something that I would like to um, make more formal or have um, in writing. Um, so a lot of this um, has been sort of responding to and listening to needs of instructors who are interested in OER creation or interested in digital book publishing and sort of responding to those with um, some boundaries and some offerings around what we can support over time. So I wanna now talk about some questions that come up when I offer, um, when I talk to instructors about press books or do these workshops. Um, these are questions that have come up most often. Um, many of you are probably familiar with getting these kinds of questions from instructors at your institution. Um, and I have to say for most of these, I don't have a perfect program, programmatic implication answer. Um, we're still defining our open education program, um, really wanting to support authorship, OER publishing, and open pedagogy. Um, so some of the questions that come up are, how do I get recognition for this work and share, share it beyond the UW? Um, open licensing, ownership, platform lockdown, when is my book ready to be published, how to involve students in OER authorship, and how to design OER that reflects an instructional design, um, or instructional style, excuse me. Um, again, these questions are tricky. I don't have all the answers, but now I'm gonna go into each of those to talk about um, some of the implications and um, some things that we've done. So the first question, how do I get recognition and share beyond UW? Um, faculty may expect traditional publishing services that include marketing when you offer a platform for publishing. Um, uh, and to my knowledge, even with commercial publisher, faculty will need to do some self-promotion and promote through their networks. So usually when faculty ask about this, I advise them on ut utilizing the open textbook library and Rebus community to spread their word if they're going to be doing a project that involves um, um, creating an OER. Um, for many of the projects, I also, um, or when faculty ask me about this, I also encourage them to tap into their own networks um, to spread the word about um, their projects. Um, I really was inspired by the presentation earlier today um, and think that we could be doing so much more to um, promote works once they're created on our network, but we're just, we're not there yet. 
Um, we've also talked about using our OER advisory committee in this way. So we have an advisory committee for OER at the UW libraries um, and sort of building some sort of system of um, promotion or perhaps doing a, a program of support similar to the textbook heroes um, program that was discussed earlier. Um, we have, um, we did hold an event um, for Open Ed Week um, this year, a panel session on open textbook authoring, where we featured um, three of our um, authors, um, including Justin Marlowe, Eduardo Viana de Silva, and Ian Schnee, um, um, for each of them to talk about their open textbook project, what motivated them, and to draw attention. Um, unfortunately, this happened like the day that COVID started. So it was, it was the day before we all had to go home and have stay at home orders. So attendance was not as high as I would have liked, but um, I'm hoping that in this, um, it was a really wonderful event and I'm hoping we can kind of build on that um, to do events or um, some online marketing to help promote um, student projects. Um, I'm sorry, to, pro to promote um, OER projects. Um, we also get uh, questions about concerns about open licensing, regularly hearing that faculty maybe aren't comfortable or knowledgeable about open licenses, this fear that um, others may steal or mis mis misrepresent their work or that they may improperly use someone else's work when they create something in Pressbooks. Um, we've also heard a few questions from faculty or concerns that because the libraries is providing a platform, Pressbooks, that that platform itself may try to take or use um, or take ownership of their work. Um, I think faculty are probably rightfully concerned, likely having had lots of different experiences with various um, ed tech companies and trying to navigate um, their ownership um, over their own um, intellectual property in the past. I'm really grateful that we have a really fantastic copyright librarian, Marion Fukori, who helps us kind of navigate um, these questions and guide faculty on deeper copyright issues and help them understand. Um, I think we could um, do more around this training, so I include a little bit about Creative Commons licensing um, in my Pressbooks training, but I think that could be improved. Um, I'd like to be able to show more examples that demonstrate best practices and attribution. We also recently convened a task force in the libraries um, who worked on creating standardized language for our various platforms terms of service. So that includes Pressbooks as well as our um, pilot of Manifold. Um, this helped us talk through as the library's decisions we wanted to make about how to communicate around things like copyright and open license. Um, we wrote a, re a new user policies and guidelines document as well as a new terms of service for our Pressbooks network. It states that the network is intended for OER, recommends assigning a Creative Commons license, encourages maximizing accessibility, and states that we'll select works for our Pressbooks catalog to feature there at our own discretion, prioritizing those with an open license and that allow for derivative works, utilizing accessibility best practices, and are intended for use in the classroom. Um, and um, we uh, were also, um, inspired by the um, guidelines in terms of service at the University of Houston libraries, as well as UC Berkeley, um, and hope that having these standardized guidelines will help us and talk about how this work is op operationalized in the libraries across departments. Um, I also get this question quite frequently, like, when, when is my book published? Um, what does publishing even mean in this context of sort of an author DIY model? Um, I think faculty um, sometimes expect that when I'm teaching about the Pressbooks platform, I'm also offering editing or reviewing services or that someone will be sort of signing off on the publication. Um, and we don't have that model. Um, we can advise them on copyright or how to make their work more accessible, but we don't have these kinds of formal publishing services built into the OER program. Thus far, if an instructor creates something in Pressbooks um, that's openly licensed and intended for a course, and if they consider it done, we add it to our Pressbooks catalog. I then send that book information to our cataloging metadata services um, staff in the libraries, and they create a record for the work. Um, so they found a MARC template for cataloging OERs created by Mount Hood Community College useful for this process. Um, so we're kind of building this process for how to um, share works um, uh, sort of beyond just our Pressbooks catalog page, um, getting them into our discovery um, catalog. 
um, and sort of uh, documenting and streamlining that, that process. Um, but this means that we have a combination of peer-reviewed works and works that have not been formally reviewed in our public press books catalogs. I think for most instructors who are motivated to create course materials, that's an okay thing. Um, some may have concerns around the credibility or legitimacy of DIY publishing in this way. Um, again, we're still sort of figuring this out and what this means in terms of um, programming and service models. How can I involve students in OER authorship? So a lot of the examples that I showed before are student authored works. And this has sort of been a very um, somewhat pleasant surprise that I've found over the last two years is that there's a lot of interest um, on our campuses from faculty who want to sort of replicate other um, open textbook and OER projects that involve student authoring. Um, I think the Badass Women's Zine Project and the Critical Philippine X History Projects have been inspiring, um, both through those authors or instructors promoting their own work and through my workshops. My colleague, Denise Hatwig, who's head of digital scholarship at the University of Washington Bothell Libraries, um, worked on the, who worked on the Badass Women's Zine Project, um, created this guide to open student work. Um, which includes a statement of student rights in open environments um, and things like um, students having a right to choose how their work will be used, how they want to be credited, and that they should not be required to perform, perform labor for open projects that don't have um, educational value. Um, Denise and I, as well as our um, instructional design librarian, Marissa Petrick at um, University of Tacoma, um, are the three network administrators for our Pressbooks network. And we're kind of looking at the summer, um, how we can um, sort of consolidate and create some um, guidelines or best practices around um, supporting these projects when faculty come to us and want to convert an assignment into a Pressbooks publication in which students author their work. Um, so one of the things we've done in the past is have students sign a student project agreement form that gives the library's permission to make the project publicly available and gives students options in terms of being identified as the work creator or not. Um, this is, we're learning a lot um, through this process and kind of bumps in the road that come up and ways to improve it, but, um, um, and need to do more to streamline the process. Um, but I'm, I'm excited and encouraged by the amount of interest that there is in, in that kind of work here at our university. And finally, this question comes up, um, sort of the, how can I design an OER that reflects my own instructional style? Um, and I think this gets up to the issue that, you know, Pressbooks is one tool sort of within the OER creation ecosystem and publishing and pedagogy are very much intertwined. Um, with our Press, Pressbooks EDU network, um, we get really rapid support from the Pressbooks team when our faculty members have questions. Um, these questions go through us as network administrators and we um, ask Pressbooks and kind of um, bring the answer back to faculty. Um, when faculty create OER that include things like quizzing or other assessment elements, um, like or integrate their OER, want to integrate their OER with the learning management system, Canvas, or utilize other learning technologies, I think that brings up questions about what role the libraries plays. Um, since COVID, I've seen more interest from faculty who want to use Pressbooks to replace a course pack or use interactivity in Pressbooks for things like grading. Um, and faculty members may be more concerned with getting their work up for teaching and learning purposes and less um, concerned about things like open licenses or accessibility. Um, so I think it raises a lot of questions on, you know, what are the limits around um, and what, what should we be offering in terms of guidance, training, and preservation when things are very interactive and involve different platforms, some of which we just don't have the capacity to support. And how do we try to align our priorities and bring faculty along um, to OER in this moment? Um, I think these questions are more complex than what we're used to in terms of traditional modes of library support for formal publishing. Um, and as we work to support faculty in creating and offering OER that are dynamic, it'll be important for us to have conversations about what support looks like and how we work together. Um, it also raises this question, you know, if we're a big institution, we also have departments and schools um, who have their own instructional design staff and LMS support um, that are kind of maybe separated off from the larger campus um, LMS support. 
Um, and right now we don't, I don't really have a big picture understanding of all of those units and departments and what, what departments do have that kind of personalized support and not. But I think getting a better sense of that can help us um, better understand um, how Pressbooks might fit in to um, complementary services in those other um, units. Okay. So um, now I wanted to move into talking about a couple of points about sustainability. I think when we talk about programmatic implications, it's important to think about how to sustain these. But I also see that there may be questions that have come in. So I just wanted to pause and see if there's anything I could address from the Q&A right now. Lauren, there was a question about who is on your advisory committee. Yeah, great question. Um, our OER advisory committee is made up of representatives from the UW Bookstore, um, UW Accessible Technology Services, the UW Center for Teaching and Learning, UW IT Learning Technologies, which manages our LMS, um, Undergraduate Academic Affairs, our Continuum College, which provides a lot of distance and online learning. Um, we also have a faculty representative, and I have a few other librarian colleagues who are on it. It's co-chaired by uh, Madison Sullivan, who's our current fine and performing arts librarian. Um, and I'm probably missing some folks. We also have a student representative from ASEW. So there's a pretty broad representation um, on that group. Lots of stakeholders from across. Yes. Campus. And the other question, do you make recommendations to your authors on when, how often they should publish updates? Is there any concern about or plan for archiving previous versions? That's a great question. No, we do not. So we really don't, um, we don't get into working with the content of the books um, or the projects that people are creating in press books. So, um, if a faculty member is creating something and feels that a new edition needs to be made, they have access to the platform and can do that. Um, that being said, that does bring up sort of preservation and archiving questions and versioning. Um, we really haven't um, addressed that, but I'm hoping to now that we have um, confirmation that we'll be continuing with this network in the future um, to look at that. Um, I think that's an important question. So, Thanks. Those are all the questions for now, okay. but if there are more out there, uh, we invite you to post them. Okay, thanks, Karen. Okay, so two things um, I wanted to mention that stand out to me about um, sort of the going off of the programmatic implications of teaching press books and offering um, some level of OER authoring support. Um, uh, are how to sort of build capacity within your organization um, and also how to avoid burnout. Um, so the first is sort of, you know, how to, how to leverage colleagues to increase capacity for OER support. Um, often open educational uh, work in libraries falls on the shoulder of one individual who has that part of their position or who takes on OER advocacy out of interest or alignment with their position or role. Um, in larger institutions such as ours, where we have over 60 subject librarians, um, I think it's really necessary to work with colleagues to help scale OER services. Um, so I presented about this um, at the Open Ed Conference last year, but um, this is uh, just wanted to mention a subject librarian training program, um, which I kind of hinted at before when I was talking about the um, Pressbooks projects that came from um, librarian connections. Um, so back um, in 2019, I was a uh, Spark Open Education Fellow and um, was interested in putting on some programming around open pedagogy and press books on my campus um, and sort of pivoted towards first doing that with faculty to doing some sort of um, in-reach training within our libraries to help expand um, my colleagues, like uh, subject librarian colleagues, understanding of OER um, beyond textbook affordability. Um, I also really wanted to, um, we had the Pressbooks platform, it was new. I wanted to engage my colleagues around what that was um, so that they could um, respond to faculty when they got questions and sort of um, help me promote it um, and, and spread Pressbooks within their own departments. Um, and so that was sort of about, you know, helping me build, start to build my own capacity for OER support um, with such a large institution and over 60 subject librarians. Um, it seemed like a good idea to sort of um, 
help sort of start to scale that through um, training with my colleagues. So I offered a series of one and a half hour workshops for our various subject librarian teams. So um, librarians who um, work with departments in arts and humanities, social sciences, um, sciences, special collections, our East Asia library staff. Um, and these trainings included um, really getting into definitions of um, distinguishing OER from open access, giving them hands-on time to create a Pressbooks account and practice editing and creating works in Pressbooks, um, as well as H5P and Hypothesis, and talk to them about my, my own OER work and what I was learning and um, get questions from them. Um, so these workshops, the materials from those workshops are available online. I'm still adding to those, um, but I, it's an openly licensed um, series of slide decks that can be used by librarians at other institutions who are interested in doing that kind of work. Um, and I was happy to say that that resulted in some librarian created or co-created resources like the projects that I mentioned earlier. Um, from that, I think, um, I've learned that it's important for me to um, do more sort of um, intentional work, um, including subject librarians um, when faculty reach out to me or attend workshops um, for press books um, about their interest in that. I haven't really been doing that systematically so far, but I would like to um, involve subject librarians when I um, get contacted and find some way of sort of keeping that manageable. Um, and also connecting liaison subject librarians with new OER and new press books um, in their discipline. Um, I think OER is very complicated. Um, and I think especially in this COVID moment, um, it's important for me as the OER librarian to really continue to think about this um, sustainability of supporting OER creation and publishing. Um, by ha continuing to have these conversations with my colleagues. Um, I think that many of us were dealing with an influx of offers from commercial textbooks to faculty and vendors to librarians um, at the start of COVID. And it sort of revealed, I think, some areas where I could be doing, having more conversations with colleagues around things like privacy and inclusive access. Um, I think um, uh, traditional librarian roles sort of um, especially in large research libraries, um, prioritize the support for research over teaching and learning. I think we're still sort of learning about um, what uh, course support looks like um, in addition to things like course reser re reserves and um, information literacy and instruction. Um, so this scaling is going to take a lot of conversation as well as support um, in terms of bringing OER and Pressbooks to the rest of our organization. I also just wanted to mention the sort of sustainability of avoiding burnout um, and the importance of self-care. Um, I think OER publishing support and OER work can sometimes feel um, alienating when you're in a role where you're one person and you're trying to think of how to scale something very large. Um, part of doing that work may mean bringing people along who realistically don't have the capacity to take on uh, that work or maybe aren't as enthusiastic. Um, sometimes there aren't immediate wins and work that feels like it's sort of always in pilot or testing the water sometimes doesn't feel legitimized. So I think it's really important for us who are in these roles to surface the work that's being done, even if it doesn't feel like a program yet. Um, okay, so I wanted to move into finally some sort of um, questions that I'm hoping might spark some conversation um, or uh, Q and A. Um, these are sort of like bigger picture questions that I think I was thinking of when Karen first approached me about doing this, and we were talking through, you know, what does it mean to sort of um, build a program of support um, when you have um, press books, when you have this authoring tool, and you're seeing interest from faculty um, in creating OER with this tool. Um, but you're sort of learning as you go along and you have all of these factors like sustainability and um, capacity at your institution now dealing with, you know, everyone's staying at home and everything's going to online. Um, so these are sort of some of the things that were sparked through my discussions with 
Karen and then just thinking about um, what's come up for me in supporting the Pressbooks Network um, and OER authoring at my institution. Um, so hopefully it'll spark some answers or thoughts from those of us, uh, those of you who are at, um, attending today. So the first one is, I sometimes think about, you know, is publishing the best framework for um, when we talk about all kinds of OER creation and authorship. Um, and wondering whether faculty who are interested in creating something for their courses necessarily means that we need to use a publishing framework or if we just need to expand what publishing means. Um, especially when faculty are interested in constantly updating their work or involving students in their work or um, just sort of testing the waters with open pedagogy projects that might result in um, something that's a publication. Um, and then for libraries, does authoring and creation necessarily have to mean we create a publishing program if we don't already have one? Or could we sort of frame our model for supporting OER creation as some combination of instructional design and librarian-enabled teaching around things like information privilege, student author rights, um, alternative methods of teaching peer review and evaluation. Um, so I think I, I, it seems to me that um, a lot of times OER and press books are sort of in the little bit more towards the scholarly communication um, side of things in libraries as organizations. My position is located in our learning services unit at the University of Washington. Um, and I think this, these questions sort of speak to that, like um, where is OER sort of situated in your organization and um, what are sort of models that we might be able to think of um, beyond like publishing support or in addition to that. Um, my other question, um, supporting OER authoring and publishing can also sort of expose the like silos of openness that we have sometimes in academic libraries. So we have um, digital scholarship, digital humanities, open access support, scholarly communication, instructional design. Um, I think we need to think about how digital publishing tools that have unique features and purposes um, to support all of these things can be sort of brought into the same framework. Um, so at my university, when a faculty member comes to the libraries and wants to do something like get help with a digital project for their research, get help determining how to publish a manuscript that they may or may not be using in a classroom or for teaching purposes, um, consolidate material that they've created for a class into an online format, have their students create something openly published, explore affordable options through like e-reserves or, or um, other libraries materials or get a grant for publishing something openly um, or revise an existing open publication. That faculty member may contact our digital scholarship librarian, myself, our instructional design librarian, the UW Press, another library staff member, our campus LMS support, um, depending on how they sort of first frame their service need. Um, I think it's a reality and probably a good thing that all of these sort of areas like digital scholarship and scholarly communication and open access and OER are sort of fuzzy and have plenty of overlap. But I think it's important to be cognizant of how those of us who are supporting different forms of digital and open publishing can remain iterative and how we're serving users and how we can sort of use those entry points that faculty provide us to both support them in their endeavor and sort of push them towards open forms of teaching that are more equitable for students. Um, so I think as libraries, as organizations figure out how to support these roles and reorganize ourselves to do this work, we need to stay aware that it's better for instructors and students um, to sort of try our best to not let um, any sort of organizational silos hinder how we're working to assess and improve our programs. I think all of my colleagues um, at my institution are very aware of that and we're trying out sort of different models of communicating and collaborating to um, help make it more um, seamless and, and easy for our users. Um, and I think in terms of building a program for OER authoring support and supporting press books, I often think about this around sort of this consultation model. Faculty who need to help with something like digital scholarship projects or authoring OER often need help with things that are quite complex and go beyond sort of an hour and a half press books workshop um, and take a lot of time and knowledge and expertise from staff. Um, so I guess, um, but I'm not sure, you know, is this consultation model that's um, maybe sort of normalized for other sort of emerging areas of scholarship support 
the best model for OER authorship? Are there other models um, for sort of delivering support um, that, that are in addition to sort of a lengthy hand-holding over time kind of um, uh, project support? And then finally, my last question um, to put out there. Um, so my webinar today describes how we've piloted and implemented OER authoring and publishing support with Pressbooks and figuring out a service model when we don't yet always know what services faculty need. Um, and I think this has revealed the need to be responsive to a diversity of faculty publishing interests. Um, um, even when initially our intentions around openness aren't always align, aligned. Um, my approach has been sort of like get get as many people on the Pressbooks network as possible and then we'll figure it out. So we don't, you know, not figuring everything out ahead of time, um, but sort of building use cases and learning over time and understanding that nothing will be perfect. Oh, the nature of OER is sort of iterative. Um, so this sort of brings me to my last question, which has to do with assessment. Um, when um, when instructors are creating materials in Pressbooks that don't involve textbook cost savings for students, um, what does this mean in terms of assessment um, and demonstrating success? So um, if projects are not saving students money on textbooks, but furthering things like open pedagogy and critical pedagogy, how are we telling stories of these? How are we kind of communicating that out? Um, how does that sort of align with our mission? Um, and um, how do we sort of tell that story in order to make the case for um, future continued um, programs and support? Um, especially when sometimes the timeline for OER creation with something um, may take quite a long time and you might not have sort of an immediate win. So those are sort of my big picture questions and um, I look forward to seeing what's come up in the Q&A and thanks everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Lauren. So we have a few questions here as well as a comment in the spirit of iteration as you were just talking about. So Michaela appreciates your sharing what you haven't done yet. We're in a similar place with clarifying our services, providing referrals or help for copy editing, et cetera, and standardizing versioning, et cetera trying to formalize the program without becoming rigid. It's heartening to know that even larger organizations are approaching this in an iterative way. And next, a question from Cheryl. UA Press is part of UA Libraries, and the press was concerned about differentiating their publications from Pressbooks creations. How have you handled this at UW? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think, um, I think it's important to talk about, you know, with those of us who have university presses, like how are we sort of working together and um, communicating out um, what we're doing and what we're offering and, and distinguishing our, our services and platforms. Um, I do get questions from faculty who I think assume sometimes maybe because of the name Pressbooks that um, this is associated with the University um, of Washington Press. Um, and um, maybe, or, or want sort of access to publishing their materials through the press when they attend a Pressbooks workshop. Um, and so, you know, we've named our network UW Libraries Pressbooks sort of as a way of um, hopefully um, helping distinguish that a bit. And, you know, I'm upfront about the fact that UW Press um, has a process of, um, you know, selecting and vetting projects um, for publication through the press and that that's really a, a separate endeavor from the, um, the our OER publishing um, support model here. Our University of Washington Press um, um, became part of our UW library system back in 2018 um, and a member of the press is also part of our OER advisory committee. I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, and another member of the press is also, or staff member from the press is part of our scholarly communication outreach team in the libraries. I think there's a lot of like um, opportunity and engagement that we have with them right now, but we haven't, um, we've not sort of, um, I think, uh, we're still sort of figuring that out, sort of the messaging around that. Um, the UW Press was involved with the libraries in our Manifold pilot, and so um, they've been sort of more active with that 
um, piloting that platform. Um, but that's sort of um, along those lines of like continued conversation and just being clear with faculty about distinguishing that when they approach us about, um, about press books. Super, thank you. And mm -hmm. Marilyn has been finding at UMass that as faculty get interested in and then move forward with creating an open textbook, they develop an interest in the broader open for their scholarship and research. Are you noticing mm -hmm. a similar trend with your faculty? It also makes Marilyn think we need to continue to align open education closely with our scholarly communication, communication and digital publishing efforts. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, and I, I um, personally haven't seen that, but I could see that happening over time. We, um, I think we hear regularly that faculty who are sort of excited about doing this work really wanna hear from others, um, other faculty members at our institution and what they've tried. Um, but I haven't heard, I haven't um, had experience with that directly of, um, someone who's interested in creating an open textbook and then um, sort of that translating or me knowing about that sort of translating to their own approaches to their scholarship and research. Um, I think we do have our, our digital scholarship librarian. Um, we've, we've also talked about, you know, when she has faculty approach her with um, consultation requests for um, doing some sort of digital scholarship project. Um, which then is revealed, you know, this is actually for a class and there's a possibility of it sort of becoming an open pedagogy project or resulting in an, an OER. Um, so I think we've sort of seen it that way where um, a faculty member might think of this as like digital scholarship or they might think of it as something that's um, like a product of research that they've done, but they also happen to use it in their class and they approach the libraries for help with sort of the technology and the tools or like the project management of that. And then it ends up that, you know, oh, they're actually interested in, in the OER side of it. And so I think that's been something we're um, like thinking about having conversations around, like how do you sort of like catch all of those interests and um, align the services that you're offering to best um, steer them in the right direction or provide the support that they need. Thank you. And um, circling back for a moment to the conversation about the press, do you share the difference between UW Press and Pressbooks during your faculty presentations so that they're aware from the beginning or do you address that um, sort of at the fore? I have only been addressing it when it's come up. Um, so it's not like a, a um, let's say it's a occasional question that I get. Um, so I think I've just sort of been responding to it um, as that's come up in the workshop and not sort of preloading that distinction um, in, my, in my workshop session, so yeah. Thanks, Lauren. I would just like to invite attendees to post any more questions. We have one more here, but we have a few more minutes. So if um, you would also like to explore any of the three questions Lauren posed at the end and might need a few more words than you want to type out in the Q&A, you can also just let us know in the Q&A that you have a question and we'll unmute you and uh, try things that way. So John has a question here that I think you may have covered yesterday about um, collaborators who may be at different institutions, not at UW. Mm. So do you allow non-institutional co-authors or contributors to have accounts on your Pressbooks platform? How about students? And has this created any security concerns for your IT staff? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And no, we don't allow anyone who's not um, at the University of Washington to have accounts on our platform so that, um, uh, yeah, that's just our, our guidelines and policies there that it's only um, currently enrolled students, um, faculty or staff. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> it, does, it does make it, you know, I think figuring out ways of communicating with faculty, like alternatives that they have when they want to collaborate with someone outside of the institution or ways in which they could, you know, use hypothesis or um, password protect something that they create in Pressbooks and share it with um, someone else and get feedback on it. 
um, but we um, can't allow for account creation um, on our, our own university press books network um, for people outside of the institution. So that raises the question, I think, for collaborative works, do you know if authors tend to use tools other than press books before a UW authorized person might bring it all the way into press books? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that that um, is something that people are turning to. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that we have like eight published books and then we have 300 books in our press books network. So I think one of my goals is like, what's going on with all of those books and sort of, you know, figuring out, you know, what, what activity is happening on our network um, for people who haven't gone through us through like our, our grant program or that I'm not aware of who haven't reached out to me after a workshop. Um, what are their processes for, you know, things like collaborating with authors where they might want to um, have some collaboration outside of the institution. Um, so I, I think I have a lot to learn there, but um, um, thus far, I don't know sort of what tools people ha might have been using for collaboration outside of um, the platform. Thanks, Lauren. And you mentioned a community college that provided a framework or plan for including OER Pressbooks in their library catalog. Do you know if there's a link to that particular framework or process you could share? I am not aware of the link. It was Mount Hood Community College, um, but please feel free to send me an email and I can connect you with our cataloging and metadata services um, staff who are familiar with that. And, um, but it was Mount Hood Community College, so maybe a quick search would bring that up. Thanks. And then our last question, any process of review for the content of OER created in Pressbooks? No, we do not have that as a service. Um, so I do respond when faculty have quest specific questions about content, particularly around making it accessible or um, how they might um, style the work so that they're properly attributing um, other people that they're um, using in the work. Um, but no, we don't have any kind of like formal review or copy editing or proofreading um, services. Um, Great. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for rolling out your, your whole program for us over the last <laughs> two days. Um, we appreciate your information and reflections and these questions that you're posing um, really for all of us in the community who are, want to support publishing OER. So thank you, Lauren. Thank you all for attending and bringing your questions. And the video will be posted shortly to our YouTube. And oh, wait. Uh, Cheryl very helpfully put in the contact yes, at thanks, Mount Cheryl. Hood. So I'm dropping that into chat. Heather White at Mount Hood Community College is the contact for OER Mark. So thanks everyone for your collaboration as always and hope to see you again at Summit tomorrow. Bye bye. Thanks everyone.